Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of our Mindplex Community Dream Wonders podcast. Today, indeed, uh, a dream come true for me to have uh, as guest uh, S. Koch, who is a, a famous artist. Uh, I'm sure many of you know his music. Uh, he is joining us to talk to us about a new initiative of his, which uh, is on blockchain. It is called Proof of Reception. But of course, I have many, many, many questions for him, which are not only about his new initiative, but just to, you know, to, to underline a few things uh, about his life and career, which are totally unusual. He's a complex person, a complex artist, and... Uh, very inspirational. He grew up singing in the church and recorded his first professional music project at the age of 16. And he toured with it throughout America and Asia. And he was a very precocious uh, person because at only 17, he was a freshman studying at the Wharton School of Business at the University of Pennsylvania. And at 17, he became a serial entrepreneur there. Uh, striving to empower others to reach their full potential, which is quite, uh, I must say, quite a purpose and a mission for a 17-year-old. So that's uh, when uh, he adopted the industry name ESCO, which she comes from every situation can offer hope. And he made his first impact investment in providing opportunities for street rappers to pursue a productive career in fulfilling their musical aspirations while delivering unprecedented live performances. So this sounds like a really movie scenario to me, Sean. Uh, if you want to tell us a bit about your beginnings, uh, you know, that time, if, if we can bring you a little bit back to your 16, 17-year-old uh, age, and then I will continue with your, with your bio. But, you know, I just wanted to take a pause here and uh, introduce it to the audience from that perspective. Uh, where did it all start? Uh, thank you so much, Dr. M. Uh, it's an honor to be here with you today. And uh, hello to your wonderful audience. Um, to kind of share with you my inspiration uh, at a young age, um, it actually, I have to give credit to my family upbringing and my background. So I come from a multi-generational lineage of entrepreneurs um, that kind of stems all the way to, um, I would say, my great-grandfather. Uh, so he was born in 1876. And he was one of the first uh, Korean noblemen uh, to welcome you know, Western missionaries uh, to the Korean peninsula. This is before North and South you know, uh, was divided. Uh, and after that, he had uh, taught my grandfather uh, to study English. Uh, my mother's father, my maternal grandfather, uh, was actually um, a Shakespearean literature major um, in Korea. So he was one of the first people that had uh, learned sophisticated English. And um, in the 1950s or so, a war broke out in the Korean Peninsula. And then he was recruited uh, by United Nations and U.S. forces uh, to help fight against the communists that were coming from the north. Um, thereafter, uh, he was able to uh, rebuild South Korea, uh, kind of petitioning a lot of international organizations like USAID uh, to help him uh, provide funds you know, to the rebuilding of Seoul, the capital city. Uh, he became a major landowner there and then eventually helped immigrate uh, my parents' generation uh, to the United States and my parents' generation as well. Um, we we're fortunate to have other entrepreneurs such as my uncle, uh, my mom's younger brother, uh, his name is David Lee. He invented HDMI technology, which, yeah, which we're using right now. Um, and then even my father um, was an entrepreneur himself. He was involved in the consolidation of the accounting industry, uh, helping form Ernst & Young, the accounting firm, you know, which was the first ledger disruption from paper ledgers to computer ledgers uh, before DLP. Um, and then also um, he was one of the first investors to privatize uh, the Soviet Union. And, you know, through all these different examples, um, I came to realize uh, in terms of what my uh, ancestors and my parents have taught me, uh, business uh, is a mission. So we call it BAM, business as mission. Business is not only a means by which 
we enrich ourselves and profit ourselves, but it's a means of creating economic development. Uh, first, like my grandfather did in South Korea, uh, because of his efforts and the efforts of kind of the early founders of South Korea. Now South Korea is a vibrant economy uh, and leading you know, many different global trends. My uncle, he created a new paradigm for video to be distributed uh, conveniently you know, to our devices at home. And that kind of created new types of efficiencies that helped the content industry. And then my father you know, was involved in privatizing the Soviet Union uh, during the Soviet Union collapse. And you know, through his example, and also visiting you know, Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, Kyrgyzstan, and seeing how my father's business had impacted the lives of the former uh, Soviet Union, you know, all these things inspired me to really leverage whatever I could do at the time. I was only a 16-year-old or 17-year-old um, that was very passionate about music. Um, and that's where my name comes into play, that no matter how old you are uh, or how young you are, every situation can offer hope. And because I was passionate about music, um, I realized you know, in my college campus uh, where I was getting my Wharton business degree, a couple blocks to the west of our campus, uh, there was a flourishing you know, um, creative community of street rappers. However, these street rappers, you know, unfortunately, did not have many ways to get out of their dire circumstances. Uh, normally, they would have to resort to illicit activities like drug dealing or you know, some other form of uh, kind of incriminating uh, type of uh, business. Uh, so, you know, for me to do what I can do at that young age and kind of leveraging the experience of my family and what I was taught, um, I tried to do what I could do at the time, which was help them connect to an audience in my college campus and in the college campuses uh, in the metropolitan Philadelphia area. And that's when I launched my first business, which you had mentioned, uh, Coherent Records, uh, which has now become Coherent Incorporated, you know, um, maybe similar to Sir Richard Branson. He started in music and he created a, a kind of a, a conglomerate of sorts. Um, I started in music, you know, I started working with these artists. I realized that despite the economic um, barriers uh, between us, you know, ultimately we're both humans. You know, we both have families you know, we both want to feed them. And uh, with that commonality and that love for music, uh, we were able to grow that into a successful venture that enriched um, these artists, helped them invest into their communities, helped them feed their families. And then ultimately we caught the attention of major record labels. And, uh, you know, from there, you know, I was able to go into another genre and uh, help uh, Korean content and K-pop uh, kind of get introduced into the U.S. market. But that, that's kind of the, the response to your question of, you know, how I ended up, you know, creating an impact investment in the form of a, of a music company, uh, you know, in my early days in college. So this is more fascinating than, of course, I could have imagined. But, uh, you know, what I can take from here in a nutshell, if I may, is... Uh, how organic all this happened for you, yes? So practically, it's like osmosis, yes? From your lineage, from your family of entrepreneurs, of um, change makers, of uh, paradigm shifters, if I may say, revolutionaries, uh, mindset shifters. And, and you grew up with that, which I really, yeah, I can envy you about about that, right? I mean, because not all of us uh, have such mentors in their life and we have to find them. You know, we do, we do not grow up with them, but this is phenomenal, right? How many children, though, have these successful parents and they actually go exactly in the opposite direction? Yeah, I mean, they <laughs> die of drug abuse or, or other things. So it is, it is commendable. Uh, uh, but on the other side, I also want to underline how you actually found from a very young age a means to support the human spirit, to support the human flourishing and actually rescue people, yes, from the street and actually through, uh, from, through their own talent. And this is phenomenal. And I think each of us can be present and learn from you to actually do that. And I just wanted to say, uh, of course, you mentioned you are uh, recordings and uh, you are now the founder and chairman of Coherent Incorporated, which is a 
as you said, the parallel with Bronson is very, very well taken and it, it helps us understand how you grew. Because so it's from the music, from, you know, from the street rappers to this uh, conglomerate, which is now actually investing in entertainment, technology, energy, healthcare, real estate, fashion, finance. It's amazing. And I assume it was an amazing journey. But before I get into that, I wanted to, to ask the name, coherence. And of course, it has to do a lot also with the resonance in music, but also in science. So recently I listened to um, a podcast by George Habach, who is uh, an MIT scientist. It was on Lex Friedman. And he spoke about coherence and resonance and actually how we do not tap into this uh, coherence with other humans, with nature, and we lost our way. And if we would tap more into that, maybe we would find those more organic ways to help ourselves and our fellow humans in the same way in which you did. So what inspired you to give uh, this name to your uh, uh, business? And yeah. And so it kind of, I mean, uh, to be honest, it, it started with my last name, uh, Ko, K-O-H, right? And then it was thinking about, you know, what are some cool ways to, you know, create a wordplay? Because I'm, I'm a songwriter, you know, I, I write and produce my own music. And then I wanted to kind of create, create a creative brand. And then as you had mentioned, coherence or coherent has a lot of different meanings um, in terms of like, you know, cohering different types of frequencies. Making exactly. everything resonance, yes. Yeah, resonance. <laughs> and also, you know, that's in the physics uh, kind of landscape, but also in the sense of making something aesthetically and logically consistent, right? So, you know, all of us, if we focus on the coherence, you know, the commonalities, you know, of our essence or our being versus the differences and kind of create, you know, the haves and the have nots, I feel that us as a human race, you know, we can transcend, you know, a lot of the challenges we faced, which are honestly created by a lack of coherence. They're created by division. They're created by you know, disparities that are man-made because people are obviously, you know, we're selfish motivated. And then in terms of our own self, you know, we have a, a vacuum of, of greed, you know, which all of us have that is not, you know, ideally, um, I think. Directed, I guess. <laughs> directed, yeah, directed in the current uh, validation protocol, you know, of this centralized world, right? Because if you have somebody that's a centralized authority or beneficiary, you know, it's just human nature. The more powerful they get, the more power hungry they'll get. Now, if we can distribute that, I know you are an expert in uh, distributed intelligence systems. You know, that is kind of where I'm focusing the next part of my career. I still do music, but now I'm focusing on creating a new validation protocol that really looks at the world in terms of, you know, our humanity and our human intelligence. What is a, tr what is a true distributed intelligence? It's humanity in our brains and the memories that we hold, right? So if you think about that, you know, and, and think about, you know, how can we tap into that? You know, that is kind of what I'm on in, in terms of my, my current career and, and scaling with some of the, the leading humanitarian and also uh, tech thought leaders around the world. Fascinating. And of course, we will get to the global brain very soon when we will talk about uh, proof of reception. But I still have some more questions for you about your life and because it is so fascinating. So, you know, after all these uh, uh, countless successful business ventures which you fostered, uh, which included as artist development, producing, advising for top entertainment companies uh, around the world, I would say, uh, you have shifted focus on your own music. So you turned inwards, which I think is wonderful. And I listened to your music and we will play it for, uh, we already played it in the beginning uh, before we started to speak, but we will also play some more at the end. And I just wanted to, you know, um, um, ask you to tell us a bit more about your own music. What inspires you? How are you writing? What is the message of your music? Is it like you wake up and in the middle of the night, I have to write this song? Is it difficult to write it? How, how, do, how is this process of creativity happening for you? If I may ask you, it's very intimate, I know. And many artists do not like to talk about that. So if you don't want to, you can move on. But I had well, to ask you. Totally fine. I mean, for me, music is natural. So it's not something that I force, but it's just something that, you know, if, if you, um, Kind of look at my creative process it, it really revolves around uh you know the, the name you mentioned my my artist name is every situation can offer hope 
So it's really focused on, you know, that value of hope and positivity, love. You know, if you look through my music, you know, you'll find those themes uh, to be prevalent. In terms of, um, you know, from a young age, you know, I think I came, you know, singing out of my mother's womb, you know, they say, you know, and uh, yeah. And uh, for me, you know, I've always heard melodies and I've always kind of just been inspired by just natural sounds to kind of create, uh, you know, new types of content. Um, so may maybe give me, I'll show you how, in order for me to show you how I make music, I'll just demonstrate right now, uh, Dr. M. Give me, give me a concept to, to talk about. Give me a concept. Global brain. <laughs> you started it. So we were saying, we are the global brain. We are the people. We are. So I just keep going in like this kind of natural flow and progression. And then that kind of hits people's frequencies and creates that coherence. And, you know, that, that's, what, that's what comes to me. They say as a songwriter, the first melody you hear, you know, is from the voice of an angel. And you need to kind of take that and inspiration and document it. So, you know, for me, it's natural, as you just witnessed with the global brain, the little, little jingle over there. But, um, you know, and then also what I realized after, you know, being in music uh, for so long is music is a, a decentralized technology because, you know, music, we all have our own human receptors, which is our ears to hear audio and to self-validate that. And, you know, there's no way to, you know, even though like the Spotify's or these, you know, streaming platforms try to create a fence around music within the physical realm, you know, if you play a good song and everyone hears it, they're going to do the proof of reception and they're going to be able to validate it themselves. So, um, you know, I kind of see a lot of parallels with music and coherent and, uh, you know, a lot of these different themes that we're talking about today. Fascinating. So, yes, of course, you are born an artist. and. I also have to say, yes, because maybe many of us, uh, yes, would like to sing and so on, but you are also gifted with an angelic voice. And I have to say, it's just, it goes straight to the heart. And this is a gift, yes, which uh, I'm very happy that you are giving to the world through your songs. Uh, so, you know, it's like very hard for me reading your uh, career path, your life path, I would say, not career, because the career emerged from your life and your talent. But you are an entrepreneur who discovered your own music and talent by helping street rappers succeed. And your first impact investing was in supporting this artist, yes. Uh, so this is a, an amazingly inspiring story and unique. Uh, you, because, you know, you, you are unique because you live at this perfect intersection between giving through impact investing entrepreneurship and creative art and you uh, you merge them in a perfect whole and from which you are actually uh, acting how do you combine them how did this happen who is the true sean Ko? <laughs> S -ko? the impact investors the entrepreneurs the artists how do you define yourself um for me I, you know it's, it's kind of, i i think therefore i am i mean i'm just saying that you know, for me, it's just my natural um, adventure in life that has led me to where I've come. You know, I did not know yesterday, you know, where I would be today. You know, sometimes, you know, we try to set our course and then we pivot, you know, as different things uh, come up. Um, in terms of, you know, synthesizing music, uh, entrepreneurship, you know, along with impact, you know, as you can see, you know, it just comes very natural to me. And I'm very thankful and grateful that it does. And I'm thankful for the people like you, you know, that appreciate it and that share it with other audiences and kind of create these network effects. But, you know, as I said earlier, you know, as a 16 year old, I had no other option other than music as a business endeavor. You know, I had limited capital, you know, I had limited knowledge uh, in terms of different markets. And all I could do is create melodies, you know, with my voice and with my instruments. And, you know, eventually, you know, even like if you look at hip hop music, you know, that's kind of the, the beauty of the art form that it started from an impoverished community, um, you know, in Bronx, New York City, in the housing projects where people were taking, you know, broken records and like, you know, scratching them when wreck, 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 and starting, starting to rap and rhyme. And, you know, now it's the biggest, you know, genre that exists around the world. And everyone is trying to rap, you know, almost in every country. So, you know, I think 
if you see hope in any situation, you can kind of even take, you know, the impoverished situation that, you know, these hip hop artists have and then kind of envision a, a future potential with it. But you don't always know what the outcome is going to be. You just have hope in that current moment and you just keep on nurturing that hope. And then eventually, you know, you end up somewhere that was unimaginable from where you started. And so for you, you know, it's like uh, from all what you said, yes, in defining yourself and who you are, and it's uh, uh, impossible to define oneself. Uh, from I, what I see uh, in you, it's um, this comes to mind, you know, the right values. And obviously from, what, from your story, you grew up with the right values, generosity, uh, right action. And then when you find yourself in a situation, you with your creativity and also with your innate gifts. Yes, you immediately did the right thing. And, and this actually propulsed you naturally, as I would call it, on top of the world. And let me continue with my next question, next question which explains that. So we met at the United Nations. I think it was a blockchain call for good or something tech for good event. And you delivered a most inspiring, you were guest of honor there introducing the United Nations Secretary General. Sean, I mean, this is such a great honor. So that's what I mean. You raised to the top of the world. And, and this was through your right values, through, through your own life, through who you are. So that, uh, that opening address, and we will post the link to your address in the comments of, in, in the description of the podcast, was amazing. It was addressed to the young generation of investors. And in that room, that room was packed with uh, many billions of dollars of money from young investors. And you actually challenged them to a change of paradigm shift from the, the charity model to the proactive in impact investment model. And, and you called for this next generation of investors to put their worth in projects that help the world for good, which is related to this proof of reception, of course. But I wanted you to tell us a bit about your mission in this regard, your work with the UN. You know, how, how you got there is kind of clear from your life story. But, you know, if you can tell us a bit more about how you see this new approach, this new paradigm unfolding towards success uh, and, you know, how... If other participants have followed through uh, after that meeting, what's going on? I really want to see this happen. Tell us more about that. Sure, thank you. Um, so I had met a Secretary General on the golf course um, in New York. Wow. Yes. <laughs> my, my, my father, um, you know, he, uh, after, you know, having some successful uh, exits on his own, uh, bought the largest uh, parcel of land in the New York City metropolitan area. He hired a legendary golfer, Gary Player, to design the course. And in 1998, you know, when I was a young, young boy, he opened the golf course. And that's also attributed a lot of connections that I've made growing up, realizing that a lot of business deals do not happen in the office, but they happen outside of the office, you know, in a social environment. And um, I, when I had met Secretary General, I think the UN had burned through a billion dollars of cash, you know, from Ted Turner. Ted Turner made a huge donation and the UN, you know, was kind of at a place where, you know, I realized you can't just throw money at a problem. You know, that's not going to solve anything. Um, another thing that I was taught growing up, uh, give somebody a fish, they eat for a day, teach them how to fish, they eat for a lifetime, right? So you need to kind of figure out, you know, how to uh, empower people to leverage their personal human intelligence or their skill set. Uh, to be able to climb out of poverty and not only survive, but eventually thrive. And I think he really kind of was inspired by that discussion. And he said, Sean, why don't you put together a summit at the United Nations uh, based on giving it back and passing it on? Uh, and I will come and speak. Why don't you assemble you know, people that think like you? So I was fortunate to have access to a community you know, through my social network of you know, people similar to me, people that grew up in, you know, privileged um, foundations and, you know, wanted to, you know, do something with what they have, not only squander it, you know, like the other people that you had mentioned earlier. And, and the key here is it's not about the money. It's about the best practices that all these families have had in order to become who they are and in order for them to feed millions, if not billions of people 
uh, through their businesses. And um, you know, after kind of creating that mandate, um, that video you're alluding to in 2011, we had the inaugural summit where um, you know we had you know the biggest families from the Middle East, like the Al Saud, you know, the royal family of Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. You know, we had the Rockefellers, the Bronfmans, you know, a lot of these kind of legendary families. And our goal was, okay, you know, we cannot de depend on the government. We cannot depend on even the UN, you know, where we were speaking. You know, we need to start kind of taking the blessings that we received and becoming a blessing to the world and spreading the hope to the hopeless. And, um, you know, out of that summit, you know, which has been happening for over a decade now, um, you know, a lot of great things have uh, manifested, you know, in terms of, you know, accomplishing the UN Sustainable Development Goals, you know, more from an entrepreneurship and sustainable way. Because, you know, if you just throw money at a problem, you know, that money is gone. But if you create a vehicle by which, you know, you can create a entrepreneurship model to empower men and women, you know, in these impoverished countries and allow them to have the similar success that my family had in South Korea and scale that for their own country and their own community, you know, that is, um, you know, the aim that we've done. And, you know, obviously, you know, the world still has a lot of problems, but hopefully we made a dent in some of those problems. No, definitely. And this again, yes, uh, uh, talks about values, but also creative ways to find solutions to, to the world problems and, and creative ways, exactly as you said, I mean, a new model for the world because we know that the old models do not work. So, and, and this is uh, something which, uh, which you can, and they have guided the world towards since you were very young, which is again, amazing. I mean, Many people could have met the UN Secretary General on the golf course and said, okay, say, oh, let's take a selfie and here we are, right? That's enough. And and you, but you actually, yeah, you, you pursued that and uh, to change the world and and uh, and uh, gather all this uh, community of uh, high net worth investors who can really move the needle. And that is phenomenal. So uh, I want to commend you for that. And I invite our audience to listen to to your um, uh, to that keynote which you which you offered then, which we will uh, post uh, in the comment in the description. So I and of course recently, as of I would say, this is kind of again an organic, natural progression of your work, and this is a proof of reception, which is uh, how you define it: a better internet built on our human intelligence. And of course, yeah, I'm working for Singularity Net, which in which we are concerned with artificial intelligence. So of course, we kind of forgot or maybe gave up on human intelligence. And this is also because the human intelligence is being fragmented and I would say betrayed by the current internet and by the current social networks and by the current models. Uh, in which we are dissipating instead of coherence is the opposite. Yes, it's dissonance, and uh, and that's why I I really find you are uh, like everything which we discussed about you so far. I find this initiative absolutely amazing, absolutely on track, and absolutely you know stunning because I listened to the I would call them testimonials. Yes, uh, on from your platforms proofofreception.org, and I invite our audience to do the same. And I was like, you know, smitten. I mean, I couldn't stop. I had to listen to each of them one by one. And you have people from Ukraine. You have people from uh, uh, the impoverished uh, parts, yes, of, of New York and single moms and so on. And they talk about, again, you know, if you listen carefully, what do they say? They say, yes, I, 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 this help changed my life, yes? So I received a little bit of help, which turned me around and changed my life and enabled me to feed my kids or enables me now when I had to leave my country to survive in another country where I, you know, I just arrived with what I was wearing and with my children. So it is amazing to see that, yes? And you call that. Uh, of course, the mission being to provide human reception of true value. So, you know, this is, again, yes, uh, you call that true value. 
but we lose the notion of true value <laughs> in the world, which I was already mentioning. Yes. So, so the, I have a few questions there. Yes. And from what you told me so far, I think we already have some answers about what is true value to you because you grew up with the right values, but also, you know, uh, what vacuum is proof of reception feeling? How does proof of reception work to bring true value to the world? Can you explain to us a bit? Yeah, so thank you, Dr. M. I but you also have... how you got this idea, which I know you will tell me, oh, I just, you know, it's natural. I don't know how. <laughs> Dr. M, thank you for highlighting that um, uh, and, and highlighting the humanitarian use case that we did in 2021. But, um, you know, uh, I think we both have uh, dug deep into blockchain over the years, you know, I was um, one of the first market makers for distributed ledger technologies uh, in 2016, helping, you know, early protocols uh, expand into South Korea. So that is kind of my way of getting involved early on. You know, uh, I participated in what's called the Kimchi Premium. So we would buy crypto on U.S. exchanges and sell them in South Korea as a market maker for a high profit. And uh, eventually... I realized that you know blockchain in itself, despite the lofty goals of decentralization, it also suffers from its own problem called the blockchain trilemma. So if you're familiar with the blockchain trilemma, you know any blockchain that's operated on proof of work or proof of stake, eventually it becomes centralized because those validator nodes are owned by a handful of institutions, which we're seeing in all these major blockchains, the handful of owners that own these validation nodes. Furthermore, you suffer from uh, lack of scalability. So when you have a handful of validators, obviously they cannot validate everything in the network and the network suffers from many outages, which we've, we've seen with a lot of these networks. And then finally, uh, they suffer from lack of security. So when you have you know, billions of dollars of crypto uh, that's being stolen from these blockchains, you, know, you have to kind of take a step back and think about okay, maybe this is not the real way to decentralization after all. And that's when I started studying proof of work and proof of stake and realized that could there be another consensus mechanism? Could there be another validation protocol that is truly decentralized? And I realized that blockchain, okay, it, it, it distributes storage of the transaction, but it doesn't distribute validation. And that's when I came upon proof of reception as a new means by which we can distribute validation. So right now, as you speak with me, Dr. M, you're self-validating my values and you're storing it into your mind. And similarly, that's how proof of reception works, where the reception is the finality. And to think of this in the realm of you know, today, why do we think it's 2023? It's because the reception that all of our intelligence has says it's 2023. Could it be 1999? Could it be negative five? It could be anything, but it's the consensus of the individual receptions of our human intelligence to say it's 2023. So after realizing that we as humans naturally have our own validation protocol and are able to self-validate these transactions, I applied it into uh, code, You know, working with some of the leading computer engineers that I had in my network and was able to test this algorithm and realize that this is the optimal way to validate transactions in a digital, dis digital sphere. So instead of a third party intermediary validating my transaction with you, you know, whether it's a centralized system like big tech companies, you mentioned social networks, uh, instead of, a, instead of a, you know, miners, you know, mining algorithms, instead of staking algorithms, it's our reception, your reception of my value, my reception of your value, in conjunction, that creates finality of the transaction. And because now we're able to self-validate our own transactions, similar to how the single mother in Harlem or the refugee in Ukraine was able to self-validate their credentials to get their donation, it's much faster. It's instant because there's no third party involved. There's no gas fee or transaction fee because you're self-validating your own values. And it creates you know, even better cybersecurity because... There's no way for a hacker to infiltrate all these different validation points when it's at an individual human level. And there's no consolidation of our uh, proprietary information. And ultimately, I know, you know now the blockchain world is moving into zero knowledge proof and 
additional technology to solve problems. My approach is to remove the technology, focus on our human intelligence, and we all have a unique private key, which is our biometric, right? So nobody can replicate the private key of my face ID or my thumbprint. And that is kind of the ultimate security that we find to move us away from kind of a centralized paradigm that is subject to all these inefficiencies into a more distributed intelligent system with each human being their own validator. So hopefully that kind of shares the, yeah. No, absolutely. And because of course it changes the paradigm, yes, from having that technology at the center of the truth, which is that's what we call it, yes. I mean, uh, blockchain is yeah, uh, trustless because uh, we do not need humans. You come back to the human, right? And you humanize it. And this is actually what we lost. Yes, in, in our romancing with technology, we lost uh, humanity. And now you are coming back to humanity and you are saying, no, it is between me and my donor or me between me and the other people. And even so in music, even in music, which we mentioned earlier, unfortunately artists are starving and they don't make any money on their content because once again, centralized validation of streaming platforms, social media, you know, they are tricking us to think we're having fun, but really we're just giving them more of our values for free. And now, you know, the internet at large, you know, we are all slaves. So people did not realize slavery was a bad thing in America until people spoke up. But now we are all data slaves and we need to take that validation back into our human control, which we can do now because everything is online and everything can be proven in what I call as an alternative to zero knowledge proof. I call it infinite knowledge proof, where we have access to all our values and now where we can prove one another based on the infinite knowledge of the internet, but validated at the edge based on our human intelligence. That's incredible. That's really uh, fascinating. And again, so creative. I mean, just again, shifting the paradigm on its head, yes, from technology to the humanity. And um, so I see that you want to provide a um, free proof of reception terminal for every human being to be able to validate these transactions. So you can tell us a bit uh, about that. Uh, how, how will that work? And, uh, because I, mean, I, I think you, um, you already articulated some of those examples because refugees can, can retrofit. So the beauty of POR, it's a binary code that you can retrofit into any application interface. So even if you're using Instagram, as you saw on proofofreception.org, they're able to just prove their reception you know, and prove their credentials straight from any interface, and that's the beauty. You don't have to move to a different blockchain. You don't have to be dependent on Solidity. You can self-validate your own contracts and do it from the convenience of any interface based on your humanity. So that's the first solution of how easy it is to interoperate with this new type of consensus mechanism. Secondly, in terms of donating this to every human being, number one, we're saving millions of dollars for corporations because if a corporation doesn't have to do the validation of the data anymore and they can offset it to their customer, they're saving compliance costs, they're saving operation costs, they're saving you know, cybersecurity costs because there's nothing to hack anymore because a customer is moving that validation to the edge and it's not centralized. So as we license a commercial port, so port is our software license, proof of reception terminal, P-O-R-T. As we license a commercial port, we're able to donate a humanitarian port to somebody in need who may not have a device, who may not have electricity to power that device, who may not have the connectivity to connect with other devices. And now, let's say that you're a poor villager and you have no money. A lot of people are saying, let's bank the bankless. In my opinion, the key is not to give them money. The key is to enable them to convert their humanity into their currency. Once again, once our humanity is our currency, we can do new types of barters. So if I'm a poor villager, I have no money, I can use my port. I can find other ports of like a restaurant owner. The restaurant owner doesn't have money to pay for dishwashers, but guess what? They have excess food. So now we're bringing back the barter economy that existed before fiat currency created you know, this type of haves and have nots. You know, money is just another medium or centralized validation. Now the poor villager can go and find that restaurant, go wash dishes and trade that humanity to get a meal and feed themselves, right? So 
now, you know, within, within like Latin America, Africa, Southeast Asia, some of these countries were able to create a new data network that allows the local citizens to become validators for their own sovereign data network because these poor countries previously didn't have the, uh, you know, the hardware and the data centers and all those things. PUR enables every human to become the validator of their human intelligent internet now. Phenomenal. And, you know, um, I would like to, because I know you go beyond that. So let's say everybody has a terminal now in their home where every human has a terminal. Yeah. And believe it or not, even, even though people don't have money, somehow they have an iPhone. Exactly. As you explained. Yes, exactly. <laughs> and, and they can use like with Instagram and so on and so forth. So, but you mentioned, uh, I mean, as far as I know that you also uh, use this, the skills, like these portions with uh, NFTs. Uh, so how, how does that work? Yeah, so we call the values or what the blockchain world called NFTs, we call them portions. Portions, and por yes. Portions is P-O-R, proof of reception, and then with T-I-O-N. But as I said, every human is now their own port of their own humanity distributing their humanity to other ports. So the portion is also um, pronounced as port ion, P-O-R-T-I-O-N. And if you think about physics, positive and negative ions, what do they do? They naturally, you know, attract one another, right? So if I have money, you have a song, our port ions are gonna naturally match. If, I'm, if, I, if I can wash dishes and you have a free meal, okay, our, our port ions are going to naturally match. And that's the definition of portions, but also it's more of a savvy term because NFTs, non-fungible tokens, you know, obviously, you know, have a bad rap because they've been associated with, you know, expensive pictures of monkeys and cats, you know, which were overvalued. Um, and uh, we want to kind of get away from the scammy side of crypto. And that's how we call it portions. And ultimately you can portion any aspect of your humanity. You can portion your time, you can portion your skills, you can portion your identity in the form of data. And now, you know, via these portions, you can survive and eventually thrive uh, to become your own validator and to become your own entrepreneur and climb yourselves out of poverty. This is so amazing. I mean, how you explained with the positive and negative ions and finding each other and matching. The thing is, singularity net, yes, we call that algorithmic chemistry. It's more about because we are a platform on which we develop and deploy software agents, which again, one can be about, let's say, flights, booking, another one, hotel booking, and then they can combine into a, a vacation <laughs> business. So, and they find each other, yes. So, this is very, very. That, previously, that would have been validated by you know Travelocity or Priceline or all these intermediaries that stole our data. Now, now we can plug into those different data sets and use our ports to validate it ourselves, right? And, and get a better pricing because there's nobody in between. So that's amazing, and we'd like to collaborate with you on that and see how we can help also with our. I I'm just as excited see. about you know this conversation in terms of what will come out of it, you know, because you know with your thought leadership and your hundreds of peer reviewed papers. Um, you know, it is the next step of taking POR into the academic world and into, you know, some of these more sophisticated institutions. And Dr. M, I thank you for that. No, and absolutely. And I thank you for actually bringing it to, to the people because I don't want that to stay in the ivory tower like most of the publications do. So, so and, and that's why I'm saying also with Singularity Night, I mean, this is, yeah, we, we want to deploy it to the people and we are here for, for the Once people again, and for our community. People to people uh, transaction, but even from the, singular, from the point of robotics or from the point of generative AI, you know, all those inputs, if they're validated at the point, you know, of the execution, that's going to create new efficiencies. So recently, we've been approached by you know very secretive government agencies saying, uh, you know, this algorithm can enable um, data transfer between drones and satellites and other types of computers that are not only human and create new types of security that we never imagined before. So you know, there's a lot of applications that we would love to scale with 
you and uh, your your organization. Yeah. So so this is this uh, conversation is also the start of a multidimensional collaboration, and I wouldn't expect anything else knowing your multidimensionality by definition, right? So and also another thing I wanted uh, I was inspired to think about when you mentioned this. Um, edge power uh, 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 like like you're going to the edges yes and everybody's validating at the edge so we actually are of course also working on decentralizing computing and uh, edge computing and so we just um, launched and we had a podcast just uh, before this one will be released uh, on our hypercycle which is the uh, edge computing uh, infrastructure which we are deploying with um, uh, we want a box in every home, but of course, until then, we will put boxes in every, let's say, uh, district or so. And I'm thinking that would be also another another collab- potential but also, collaboration. What about, what about on every device, right? Take it a step further, right? And then because, yeah, because, because our, our inputs into our phone, our text messages, our payments, all that can create a human intelligent, generative human intelligent for ourselves, right? Because the input, is, the input is just as important as the output. And the problem with generative AI today is the data models they're training on, they're stale data. And, number, and also, they're not, they're not permission data. That's where they're getting lawsuits. But I see a future together with your edge computing combined at the device, along with proof of reception, taking our human inputs in our phone that's owned by us, protected by us, proprietary to us, creating new efficiencies for humanity, where in the future, Dr. M., we don't even have to work for money anymore. We can just use our human intelligence and we can live in a garden of Eden and just you know, maximize our human intelligence and share love and create a utopian you know, Exactly, future. and that's, that's another thing which I wanted to, uh, the next thing I wanted to, uh, to take and I took from what you mentioned, then that is the new economies, yes, which this such a paradigm is opening and we are working on that. Maybe also, as you know, this is my passion as well of a better world, a better ways, better financial system, sustainable, whatever. But this barter economy, I've just been talking very recently with Dr. Ben Gertzel about that because we have uh, Dr. Kabir Veitas who did his uh, PhD thesis on uh, a barter economy and he is uh, the CEO of Nunet and that is also, yeah, it's again uh, related to, to computational power to the edge, but it's more more than that. Also um, Dr. Ben Gertzel's son, uh, Zaratustra Gertzel, he did a master's thesis on offer networks and barter networks. So uh, we are very interested and we just recently discussed with, uh, I do not know if you know, the, the Earthwise Center uh, and uh, for Civilizational Transformation, which are also looking at this kind of new economic models. So we'd like to engage you also in that and, and involve your terminals and your paradigm and, 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 and the beauty of how I structured this, this is thanks to my father, you know, who's an accounting genius, is I, I've donated everything to a foundation. So it's called the Web, the Web Trinity Foundation. And the Web Trinity Foundation is an alternative to Web3. Unfortunately, Web3 wasn't really decentralized, as you mentioned. And the, the, the Trinity is 3-N-I-T-I. So it's spelled W-E-B, 3-N-I-T-I. And each of those three NITI is one of our principles. So the three N's is natural, necessary nourishment. So that's everyone should have natural, necessary nourishment. There's more than enough food in the world. It's not distributed efficiently, right? And ports will enable that. And then the three I's is intrinsic, innovative intelligence. So it's our human intelligence that can be modeled as an algorithm to provide POR. The next, the three T's are transformational truthful transparency, now that we're able to interoperate with different databases uh, at a human level, you know, there is no longer, you know, kind of this wall or this divide or this in prison, you know, that provides this kind of limitation. And then finally, related to that is uh, international uh, intrinsic interoperability, right? So, so that's kind of where we are kind of bringing all these things within the Web Trinity. Uh, and uh, now we're able to free, empower and protect uh, 8 billion humans uh, in an online paradigm. So I think we're very much aligned, but the reason that I mentioned the foundation is it's a 501c3 and anyone that licenses from them automatically gets a tax write-off as well. So that's kind of an innovation where you save money 
by using POR, and it kind of has a new type of uh, accounting and business infrastructure that goes along with the new technological innovation that uh, I've invented as well. Totally fascinating. And of course, as a creativity powerhouse, which you have, I mean, my, you of course made my head spinning. I'm trying even to take notes here and please send us the links to, to this W3 NTI with all this. Uh, yes. And one <laughs> what? last thing I want to honor, you know, uh, Dr. M and all the women in the world, because the reason we've really ended up where we are, it's, it's a lot of masculine validation, masculine systems, which are I don't mean to be crass, but men are always pointing their thing in the wrong place, right? So with women, it's more about, women are always like, you know, women attributes are about reception, nurturing, looking at sustainable, you know, long-term benefits. And that's where reception also comes into play to really celebrate, uh, you know, the women attribute uh, found in the reception. You know, even in the biological process, women receive DNA and then they output a human being, a life force. So that is what we're trying to do to level the playing field in business and technology. We need to have more women. We need to have more uh, women attributes. We need to have more women design. And another thing, going back to uh, you know port portions or port ions, if you look at ancient architecture, uh, Doric columns were the masculine design in architecture. Ionic columns were the feminine design. And it's the ionic and the you know, port ions and you know a lot of these things are kind of stemming out of my creativity. But, you know, I think with any technological movement, you also have to have the cultural uh, kind of aspects defined as well. And that's why I'm into these acronyms and, you know, this kind of nomenclature at the same time. More than fascinating. And, you know, uh, just what you mentioned now, of course, yes, uh, with the feminine uh, aspect and, and the feminine values. Uh, but, um that kind of leads me also to to this question. Is there any connection? And I, I can feel the connection. Let's put it this way. I can sense it, but I cannot that, articulate that's, that's it. Awesome. You, you, that's, that's your proof of reception right there. Aha. Okay. So, but, so the question goes like that. Is there any connection between proof of reception and the artist's world? And I was saying, as I was saying, I, I can feel it, but I personally cannot really immediately articulate it. Yeah, so like I said earlier, music, right? Music. Why do we enjoy music? Because the reception is the validation. As I listen to a song, as I listen to a song I'm already validating it and storing that memory as a, some type of euphoria, right? So it's really in every system. You know, even when I, you know, when I was kind of inspired with this new type of technology, it was the fall. It was like November 2021. I was looking at the leaves change in New York, right? Why are the leaves changing? They're receiving some type of temperature signal or some type of sunlight signal, and they're changing automatically based on the reception, you know, of these external factors. So, you know, everywhere, you know, even in the transaction of music, as I said, we want to have creators to be compensated fairly and remove the third parties that control them. And uh, Dr. M, we're so excited. We forgot there's only two minutes left here. So we got to. <laughs> <laughs> I have. Uh... On the next one, definitely. So, so the, the, um, the main question is now with artificial intelligence, obviously, uh, it comes also existential threat, but also the other side of the coin. So for example, yes, so proof of reception, but, and you say, yes, if they see me there in the video that I will say yes, and all, all, all the good things, but it can be a deep fake and the technology is enabling that. And we have heard, yeah, like presidents of states saying stupid things because they were deep fakes. So. So how do we, uh, okay, so, so, you know, in this, in this uh, uh, context, my question is, uh, uh, what do you think, yes, which of the intelligences will succeed in the future? How will they coexist? And will we be able to keep AI on track, not to destroy the human well, intelligence? One, uh, one, one of the other components of POR, which I haven't mentioned yet, is the POR traits, portraits. And that is our own uh, smart contract, where instead of like ERC 721 or other smart contracts on Solidity, those contracts are still executed by a third party Ethereum virtual machine. In the case of portraits, um, POR enables you to self-validate the terms of the contract. So let's say that in order for you to broadcast something as president, you need to satisfy you know, and validate you know, certain things, your biometric, you know, your location in the White House, you know, all these different things start to become 
rules and conditions that prevent a lot of this fraud from happening because it's very unique you know, to the receiver, the reception, that this asset or this utility or this opportunity uh, can be utilized. And um, I think um, with generative AI, the problem is it's not the technology that's, that's generating the result, it's really the inputs, right? And we're seeing a lot of problems where, you know, in New York recently, there was a lawyer who got a little bit lazy and he utilized ChatGPT to make a legal brief. And then you realized in the legal brief, the judge, you know, oh, like, I think, I think they're going to disbar this lawyer because within the brief, they're citing cases that never existed before and ChatGPT just made up based on, I don't know where they got it from, but that's the problem. If the input is not right, then the output is wrong, right? And once again, it comes down to the values and the soul and our heart and the inside of, you know, our motivations. You know, if we don't have the right inputs and we don't have the right source and foundation, the technology is not going to have the outcome that we intended. And that's why proof of reception allows you to ensure uh, that the input, number one, is consented. You know, all these big companies are being sued by, um, you know, IP holders because they trained on data that was that they didn't you know give the copyright for so consented that's what a port can do and then number two it's the data that's relevant you know for that particular use case and that's where the human intelligence comes in because you know you have to kind of have that critical thinking in order to match the right input to have the output that you desire and um, once again unfortunately uh, dr m it's it's a function of greed right a lot of silicon valley firms a lot of you know equity holders, they want to make a lot of money, so they're hyping something up. But it's analogous to the crypto craze where people are hyping up crypto, even though it didn't really have any practical uh, you know, benefits. So I think that you know, AI and machine learning and large, lingua, large uh, language models, all these things are great, but it really depends on you know, making sure that POR is able to have that human intelligence uh, be able to, you know, eventually, you know, the idea is all of our human intelligence will become our own portraits and we will be licensing our human intelligence to generative AI companies, right? Versus, you know, them stealing all this data and scraping it and, you know, creating, you know, wasting all this electricity and computing, mind you, you know, to, to, to create things like that are not- of resources, yeah. Yeah, maybe, maybe you can like, you know, trick your, your, your middle school teacher, but beyond that, you know, you know creating an essay, you know, there really isn't a, a, a relevant use case until, you know, the inputs are, you know, filtered and that's where human intelligence comes in. And this is so aligned with our mission at Singularity Net, obviously, to take uh, the power of AI from the hands of the greedy uh, corporations and put it in the hands of with the people. And again, coming back to humanity, but again, also with the people can do bad things and we do a lot of stupid and bad things. So, you know, we are also working on a project which is called the Future Humans. Because as you mentioned, and as you, I feel you are coming from the future. Yes, we have to come from a future where we as humans are evolved enough to come back to our hearts and to actually, in whatever we do, to come from those values with which you grew up, but maybe not everybody did. And and as a question here, you know, it's not only a question, but I want to say, what. Well, I would like to know where we can find all this information about the proof of reception traits and so on and so forth, because this is an antidote to deep fakes, which we want to use as soon Definitely. as possible. I mean, even we're talking to the, uh, you know, big, you know, e-commerce platforms like Ticketmaster, for example. Wow. Ticketmaster had a big problem with uh, bots, you know, buying, right? So if you can retrofit a port into the interface for Ticketmaster, now you can prove the humanity of the buyer and you can even you know, ha have them feed in their social media data. Wow, this person really loves Taylor Swift. You know, let's, let's give them some type of reward. And you can kind of create a new dimension to transactions so that bots are not the ones buying these tickets, you know, for nefarious um, causes. So if you go to, um, you know, I'm sure we'll distribute some links, uh, you know, that are available. But, um, uh, you know, you go to proofofreception.org. You know, that is kind of the front-facing um, humanitarian use case. Um, that uh, thankfully inspired you, Dr. M, to get excited about it. Yeah, but now with the more technical stuff, um, you know, I do have a lot of um, keynote presentations and technical documentation, which uh, uh, we'd be happy to share with your audience as well. Uh, it would be fantastic. And also, of course, uh, uh, then when we start the collaborations with NDA. 
And Dr. M, we need to make a paper together too. So. Oh, that, I would be so happy and honored to 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 write a, a paper with you and and actually do some research together, of course. And and I wanted also to to ask you, uh, you know, take it on from here now, uh, because we at Singularity Net are building minds of robots, yes, which uh, can do many things which we thought humans could never do, including composing music, yes, and poetry and. Uh, uh, I don't know if you have seen our Desdemona robot soloist in the Jam Galaxy Band playing together with Dr. Ben Gertzel, who is playing uh, as, uh, 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 anyway <laughs> in the band. And and uh, the question is, I have a few questions actually, and you can take it from from my questions because I have a lot of questions, f- uh, and I want to see your uh, perspective on that. So do do you ever envision yourself co-creating with AI or using AI to augment your artistic creations? What do you think about this evolution as an artist? And then uh, how do you see the future of art itself in this regard? Because many artists feel that AI is, as you mentioned, uh, stealing their creation, their others uh, stealing their IPs and so on. And uh, now the question is, what if AI becomes more creative than any human on the planet? What is your take on this? You know, because um, from my side, just to tell you my feeling as a scientist, first time when I asked ChatGPT something, uh, I also asked ChatGPT something, what does uh, ChatGPT knows about me? And the answer was so accurate. And I'm like, I was afraid. And I, I then I wrote it in the prompt. I'm afraid of you. <laughs> but I'm like, who is that to know so much about me, right? And and then, of course, they uh, with Judge GPT, I can write much faster a, a book forward or find uh, some research quickly, you know, and, and prepare a talk quickly on a topic which I'm not really an expert on. And I'm like, okay, wow, how do I feel about that? Is this ethical? Is this okay? So what is the artist's take? But you're not a Nilonian artist. You are a, a techie. Uh, everything. What's your take? Um, I think um, you know we need to become. Uh, we have to kind of awaken to the fact that we created this problem, right? Because because how how else would a ChatGPT know about us unless we posted something online or we shared something that they were able to access? So as people become more savvy and realize that. Their humanity is being used uh, in ways that are not beneficial to them. That's why educational uh, interviews like this are so important. You know, once people kind of wake up to the fact that, oh, my humanity is my asset, you know, it's something unique to me. I don't want someone else to make money from it, or I don't want someone else to use it, use it in nefarious ways. I think um, AI is a great, you know, enabler in terms of like very repetitive mundane tasks that, you know, maybe you know, we'd rather not do. Like just a simple example, like when I, you know, when I'm mixing a a new album or record, you know, it's AI that's able to, you know, adjust the frequency, you know, of that sound file. Now, do I want to do that? No. It's so like, there are certain things where I see AI as definitely beneficial, but when it comes down to, you know, us being able to control AI, that is why a port is so necessary. A port is like this fail safe to stop AI from going in its own way, uh, that's not beneficial to us. So let's say a certain AI can only be executed based on a human intelligent input. And if I say stop, it has to stop because it recognizes my voice, it recognizes the unique signature of my audio and it stops, right? So that's why we have to have this guardrail or this protection around AI through a port and through our human intelligence, uh, in my opinion, uh, to make the most use of it uh, otherwise, you know, it's it's outputting garbage, and that garbage is taking storage, taking computing, wasting electricity, creating pollution, and you know the the cycle repeats, right? We want to make sure that our limited resources are maximized for things that are beneficial for humanity. That's phenomenal, and you know, so actually now I see proof of reception. Uh, even uh, uh, from another perspective, because you always give me this inspiring perspective, like an infrastructure that would enable us to safely co-create with artificial intelligence. And that is phenomenal. And it goes um, 
again, yes, uh, aligned in alignment with our mission. Because our mission is also ultimately to create uh, because singularity net platform. Yes, as I mentioned, everybody can write an artificial intelligence in software, which can combine with algorithmic chemistry with other softwares into something even better and more useful. And we call that the internet of knowledge. Yeah, so we, we want to create that kind of internet where we find knowledge, wisdom through artificial intelligence, uh, but, and, but which is useful for humanity and doesn't actually deplete it. So fortunately, we have modern data regulation that allows us to go to the big tech companies and be like, you know, give me access to whatever you have on me. You know, so, so, so they did the hard work of building the infrastructure, but now we can use ports to leverage you know, this internet of knowledge for our own favor now. Exactly, exactly. And I'd like to work together on that, of course, and uh, do research, write papers, what, in whatever way, shape or form uh, we, we can. And as together. you know, with any, um, any social awakening, you know, there's also a, a music accompanying that with our soundtracks. So hopefully we'll make some music together as well. On this oh new, uh, wow! You know, I yeah, I I, I learned. I, I really uh, we're on the cusp of the of a new renaissance, you know. And, and thank you for us enabling that, you know, through your network as well. That's phenomenal, and of course, I will uh, arrange uh, collaboration and the call first to is uh, Jump Galaxy with uh, the the amazing Diane Krause, who is the uh, founder of Jump Galaxy Band, and she's uh, also an amazing artist. And I think it will be, you know, a made made in heaven meeting. And so, and, I, Ram, I know you spend a lot of your time also in the MENA region, but uh, we've we found that uh, POR is the only um, Sharia compliant consensus mechanism because there's no gas fees or interest, and it's using your own humanity to self validate any value, which is you know what the essence of Sharia law is as well. So we're universally applicable to any philosophy, religion, and culture as well. That is phenomenal because we are involved in uh, in a project and actually in many projects there, but also Sharia compliance is uh, one of our main preoccupations. So we should, uh, I'm making notes here for so many <laughs> possibilities to collaborate with you and, and I'm going to follow up um, on this as well. And thank you so much. I will connect you with uh, Alex Blagirev, who is our uh, I would call him chief strategy officer, but he is also, he is in charge with this project. So I, um, I have one last question, if you still have time, quickly, quickly. Uh, yeah, maybe two minutes. Two minutes. So the last question is, what is your take as an investor on the AI bubble? Was that, I have to touch on that with you as an yeah, investor. Um, I think I, I highlighted some of those um, sentiments earlier. It's similar to the crypto bubble where people are, trying to just, you know, make a lot of money or raise a lot of money. But like I said, if the source of that data, of the data models that generative AI is training on, you know, is not something, you know, that's um, accurate or is not something that's live or current or relevant, you know, those data models are just big machines that are outputting garbage. So, you know, I, I believe, like you said, we need to have a safe uh, relationship between human intelligence and artificial intelligence, which PR enables. And then hopefully, you know, we can create new efficiencies in the future where, you know, let's say that, you know, with my human intelligence and my port, I'm a coffee drinker. And then in the morning, you know, every morning, Starbucks has a coffee ready for me. And all I need to provide them is with my consumer data and I don't have to pay for it anymore. So the more that we kind of create these new types of paradigms and it's beneficial, it's great. But, um, you know, right now it's a lot of hype and hoopla and um, hopefully it'll go into something more meaningful in the near future. And with, with work like yours, definitely will. And I would like to leave, um, I want to thank you, of course, for your time. I'm sorry I had many more questions, but I know you don't have time. I, so we will invite you again for thank the you. other questions. I just wanted to leave the audience with, again, yes, uh, because this, I think, encapsulates uh, who you are, and this is from the right values to do it right. And that is uh, one of your last albums. So I, we will leave the audience uh, with this music from you. Thank, thank you, you again. Thank, thank you, you so thank much. You. Thank you for reception, everybody. Thank you.
Thank you.